George W. Bush and John McCain are two sides of the same coin and it doesn't amount to a whole lot of change. You nailed that joke, love it. I am very proud to introduce my hero and my mother, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. You know, I started with Hillary Clinton when I was like 23. I think I just turned 23, but I was very much like kind of figuring things out on my own. And I do think that like that meant that because so much of the time I was learning on the fly and the Clinton world is not a place where there's a lot of um, uh, organized career development. And so I, I really always felt like I was at times doing a good job, of times feeling like I didn't know what to do or that I was sort of failing in some way. And I remember after that convention speech, like I felt really proud that I had been part of that process and helped them succeed in that way because it was really high stakes. And, I, and I'm like, there are parts of that process that I actually don't even feel like I would want to talk about in this video because it was such a personal thing for, you know, Hillary Clinton to be going through this, right? She had thought she was going to win and then she didn't and she had this moment to kind of take a stage that she thought she would take as, no as the nominee and that was really hard. I feel like by the convention, the sort of bad blood between the Obama and Hillary campaigns had dissipated somewhat <laughs> or mostly, I would say even mostly. The candidates get over it first. <laughs> The candidates move on. That's it's very the, true. It's the very it's true. the staff members that carry the I think uh, the grudges a little bit longer, and I think that was probably true um, in in Hillary world at the time. I think that's also why the speech was important uh, because it really was it wasn't begrudging. It was a clear, heartfelt uh, case about why she was there, and I think after that everything was was pretty smooth. I haven't spent the past 35 years in the trenches, advocating for children, campaigning for universal health care, helping parents balance work and family, and fighting for women's rights here at home and around the world to see another Republican in the White House squander our promise of a country that really fulfills the hopes of our people. And you haven't worked so hard over the last 18 months or endured the last eight years to suffer through more failed leadership. No way, no how, no McCain. One of the challenges the whole time was figuring out how she was going to start the speech. There was a real worry, like, how, what is she going to say? She wants it to be honest. She wants to speak to supporters who might not get behind Barack Obama. She's trying to do the best argument she can to those kinds of supporters. So what is she going to say? Like, what's her real, honest to God rationale for doing this? Like, why is she standing there? And I, I, I remember someone said, well, it's because, you know, she didn't spend 35 years fighting to give up because of this primary. Like she spent 35 years fighting because she believes in these things. And if you believe in these things, support Barack Obama. And I think that was a really helpful moment, which like clarified what the speech should be. And then it got easier from there. There was a big opening that led to a joke, no way, no how, no McCain. I remember uh, 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 Hillary Clinton coming into the room while we were drafting and looking over it. And she goes, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> when she delivered that line, no way, she ha she always, and she does this all the time when she delivers a line like that that she knows will be quoted. She's got a big smile. She's like, this is the line. I'm delivering it. Here it is. My 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 favorite from that period is when she went to Unity to do that event with Obama. Uh, the line, and I, I'll just say that I don't care what, who you can come at me. I don't care. I am genuinely, I like this line. This is just a good line, which is... Uh, <laughs> George W. Bush and John McCain are two sides of the same coin, and it doesn't amount to a whole lot of change. <laughs> In the end, Senator McCain and President Bush are like two sides of the same coin, and it doesn't amount to a whole lot of change. <laughs> a plus. A plus. A plus. With honors, well, soundbite. Put these words in their mouths. That's terrible. Because they are good. Because they are good. 
We don't live. It's funny. Look at, listen, it works. We you look at you remember it. We remember it. We all remember it. Look, we you want to live in your you know highfalutin world with prestige television, but out here we watch Young Sheldon and we like a good soundbite. To make America once again a nation of immigrants and of laws, to restore fiscal sanity to Washington and make our government an institution of the public good, not of private plunder. To restore America's standing in the world, to end the war in Iraq, bring our troops home with honor, care for our veterans, and give them the services they have earned. We will work for an America again that will join with our allies in confronting our shared challenges from poverty and genocide to terrorism and global warming. Most of all, I ran to stand up for all those who have been invisible to their government for eight long years. Those are the reasons I ran for president, and those are the reasons I support Barack Obama for president. With an agenda like that, it makes perfect sense that George Bush and John McCain will be together next week in the Twin Cities because these days they're awfully hard to tell apart. <laughs> you nailed that joke, love it. You nailed it. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell the, so tell the story of that speech. Over the summer, before the con- like, like a, a, well before the convention, I like took a stab at a draft of the convention speech. I didn't know what it was supposed to be. We didn't really have a, it was, it was a very messy process and I was just sent off and I was like, all right, I'll try something. I wrote something. It was pretty bad. I think it was very boring. Maggie Williams, who was the uh, campaign manager, longtime advisor, she was like, oh, we're going to bring in Lissa to help with the speech. Lissa Muscatine, who's a great speechwriter, Hillary Clinton speechwriter in the White House, fan- incredible speechwriter. And I was like, thank, thank God, please. So we stayed up overnight. I think Lissa and I ran and got like two hours or three hours of sleep each. We're a mess. We're about to stay up overnight again. The speech is going to be the next night. So we have one night to finish. And then we get word that uh, the president, Bill Clinton, is arriving because he's also speaking at the convention. At, at about midnight, I believe, like he comes in and sits down with us to find out how it's going. And we start talking him through the different pieces of the speech, what we're thinking. He's rejecting some. Some of them, some actually like made him mad that we were saying things that like sort of he felt denigrated Hillary's candidacy was sort of but it was a very like it was a a good conversation at some point in that conversation we realized what's actually going on because he said you know what might help you all you should hear my speech and so then at like 12 30 in the morning President Clinton read us his speech and we gave him some feedback it was a very good speech and then he left and we realized like oh that was that was two hours of helping him and now it's two. Now it's two thirty in the morning, and we still which have really, to keep working. Which really just tells you a lot about the whole thing. <laughs> just. Uh, <laughs> just. <laughs> and at some point, I believe like someone else came in to like talk to us. And I remember, I don't remember when this was in the process, but God bless Lissa Muscatine. And Lissa just goes, "No, no one else. Let us work. We must finish the speech." Some of the best speeches that I've been part of are speeches where there's not a lot of people who were involved in the speech. And you're right that like, as soon as it's a speech, that's a convention speech or a state of the union, suddenly there's like a hundred people who are involved and have a stake in the speech and they are all giving you advice at the same time. And they don't really care that you're listening to advice from like 50 other people and have to incorporate all of their suggestions and edits too. And it can really quickly become a speech by committee, which is bad. I watched that speech in a hotel room in Montana with Barack Obama and David Axelrod because we were talking about how to rewrite for the 50th time his convention speech, and I was about to pull an all-nighter. But before I did, we all stopped to watch Hillary's speech, and we were we started watching it with, like, bated breath. Like, is she going to do what she needs to do? And I remember after she was done, Obama was like, she did what she needed to do and more. And I'm like, so happy. I'm so grateful. He called her. He was like, so, so happy. The country has basically made the decision 
to fire Donald Trump. They have not yet made the decision to hire Joe Biden. I think it's the central challenge for, for, for Biden as a candidate. How do I tell a story that's basically like, if you come along with me, like America will be okay.